Over 50% of the population that was studied had a huge blood sugar spike that put them in a pre-diabetic level. So mm. really knowing what's right and what's wrong and then also knowing like, okay, so I can't eat white rice. But maybe after I crush myself in the gym, it's okay to get the blood sugar spike for the anabolic window, all that kind of stuff if you buy into that. Yeah. And that's okay if I want to make my insulin jump to the roof for a recovery aspect. <laughs> Welcome to Barbell Shrug. I'm Anders Varner. We're here with Doug Larson. Mr. Strong Coffee in the house, Adam Von Rothfelder. Yo. We're at On It Acada, or not, On It Gym. There's so yeah. many On It things. On It Cafe. We spent all of our money on <laughs> human optimization. All the, the mushroom monies. coffee. All the money. The peanut butter and jelly keto. We Delicious. made it. Got in at, what, 1 o'clock last night? Three hours of sleep? We get to hang out with Kyle Kingsbury today. Um, really stoked to... Uh, get into kind of the high-level MMA that you were training at for a long time, and now a little bit of the longevity and the supplements, training, um, and just kind of those key pieces that you're taking forward and in, in your ideas of longevity and how we, how everyone can start to think about training a little bit differently for the rest of their life. Yeah, yeah similar for me. Like I'm, I'm always interested to hear how people go from being a professional athlete to still continuing to train, but at a at a lower level than they used to be where it's not their whole life, but how do you st stay healthy? How do you stay strong and athletic even though you don't have that, that carrot in front of you of being like the best fighter or the best hockey player or what have you? So, I Yeah, and I mean on that same level, I'm just as excited with uh, the idea of how your past as a professional fighter led into the idea of being the human, you know, the optimization uh, expert and, you know, the head of everything here when it comes to that at, at on it. The head of everything. No, when, it, when it comes to... That's when actually it, his title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> head of everything. Director of yeah. everything. Yeah, director it's on my business card. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aubrey doesn't like it, but yeah. <laughs> that's just the way it is. He gave me the title. I think he's cool <laughs> with it. <laughs> but I think a lot of people want to be like, oh, like, I'm in this spot and I want to get to this spot. And it's cool to see, uh, you know, meeting you two years ago and then seeing, like, where you are today. It's, it's like uh, time travel. It's really cool. Hell yeah. Yeah, so before we get uh, too far down the rabbit hole on uh, where we're at today, what, where did this journey kind of start for you, getting into the fight game a little bit and the training leading up to that? Um, maybe maybe some of the mental pieces that go into being a professional fighter. Yeah, uh, well, it, it you know, I didn't know that I wanted to fight. I fought a lot growing up, but um, it, it really transitioned after football at ASU. You know, I had played football, wanted to continue on in the NFL, but sitting on the bench I saw that my odds were – were low <laughs> yeah <laughs> as in zero that half percent <laughs> yeah. of people that make it yeah well i watch guys that started every game all four years on the defensive line not go pro you know yeah. so they're there that I mean that's the jump that people have to make that people don't really realize what it takes to get there and i understood that you know i saw the writing on the wall i also realized that i i didn't want to sit at a desk job and i didn't want to try to figure out what to do with the sh shitty degree can we say that on yeah. there? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. That's I always have to ask people because I curse so much on my podcast. You're allowed to hate on academics here, but, that's uh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I was thinking about different things, and I just realized, like, I need to train still. I was going in. I went from training with Coach House, Joe Ken, who's, you know, an amazing strength coach. Mm -hmm. um, We're looking to get him on the show one of these days. Oh, yeah, man. I'll, hey, I can set that up for you guys. No problem. Okay. You know, he's, he's a good friend. Yeah, and, um, our friend Travis Mass, an excellent weightlifting coach, has been trying to hook us up with him for a long time. We just haven't made it. The schedule's work. I'll make the call, man, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Right but uh, but a house is house has been instrumental in pushing me past what I thought my limits were. Yeah. You know, like he took me whatever I thought my limit was. He got me past that over and over again until I realized there's no limit. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something I carried with me through MMA. But you know, I went from training with him and the whole team, and you got guys pushing each other in the gym, and to now I'm running on a treadmill and lifting weights just for the <laughs> sake of looking better. And it sucked. It really yeah. sucked. You know, I missed that camaraderie and team. And I also miss the human interaction of what it was like playing on the defensive line. Like, you're butting heads with people every day. Yeah. And, you know. Physicality. That was, yeah, that was gone. Physicality so, is what, so real. What I, years were you at ASU? Uh, 2002 to 2005. Oh, wow. And so when I finished, I took about a year off. I was pretty depressed and uh, battled quite a bit in that. Uh, I won't go down the rabbit hole there, but I did a solo cast for On It, if you want to check that out, uh, going through the rabbit hole there. And then 
found uh, mixed martial arts, started training just for the sake of training, and, you know, really loved it. And uh, went to a gym where the guy happened to have a small local promotion in Arizona, and he was like, dude, you're big, you're good looking, you got to fight heavyweight for me. And I was like, ah, I, don't, I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to. I won't I be pretty anymore. <laughs> yeah. You're going to ruin it. This, this is the money maker. Yeah. We need more sexy heavyweights. I was like, man, I, don't, I don't really don't know that I want to fight people that are trained professionals. Like, yeah. I'm happy to defend myself in a, in a, in a bar or something like that. But, but um, he's like, just do it once. You know, get your feet wet. If you like it, you can do it again. If you don't like it, you never have to do it again. I was like, all right. First two fights I won in under 30 seconds, and I was absolutely hooked. I mean, mm. the the feeling you have when you hit a home run is magnified by a thousand. Like if you knock somebody out, like that kind of control and domination was something I really craved, and it was at a time in my life where I wanted to beat the shit out of somebody. So yeah. it it paired well, and um, decided to really start training. Then um, after I took my first loss, moved back to where I was from in the Bay Area and trained at AKA, which is one of the best gyms in the world. You know, Kane Velasquez was there. Yeah. Uh, DC came a little bit later. Luke Rockhold was there. You know, I mean, it, it was just it was the right fit. You know, and it was a it was a it was a fucking hard deal. Yeah. It really was, but it was beautiful because I learned so much, and that's what facilitated me wanting to learn more. You know, I couldn't just spend time playing video games in between the practices. I had to read. I had to learn about mobility. I had to learn about recovery. I had to learn about diet, health, and wellness, and nutrition to get any edge I could. Mm -hmm for competition so I could be the best version of myself and, and that's something that fighting gave me that I always have gratitude for. You didn't have to but you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Well not a lot of guys I mean fuck Cormier. Cormier is one of the best in the world and that dude yeah. plays video games every day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's also an Olympic level wrestler so he can get away with that shit. Yeah. I had more to learn, you know. I'm good friends with this trainer and, and it's uh camp is very different than his life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the the human optimization piece though that that's kind of where your focus is now and your your training the supplementation piece but how does how has that transition been a little bit I think as athletes any of, I think we all kind of get into this game chasing athletics and then we realize it's like oh I got to find a way to do this for the rest of my life and you know, we were talking pre-show injuries things things pile up um, what does that look like for you now Yeah there's there's no doubt I mean. Anytime you try to peg that meter at full and keep it pinned as yeah. long as you can, you're going to overtrain. You're going to run into issues. And that's why we see that in the sport of mixed martial arts. So many guys come into camp and they beat themselves up. You're just pulled in every direction. you got a boxing coach that wants you to hit mitts. Jiu-Jitsu guys want you in the gi. you got to spar. you got to wrestle. you got to do so much. you still got to get your weight training and cardio in. And it's just too taxing. Yeah. So finding balance was key for me. Um, Victor Conti, surprisingly, was one of the guys that taught me through blood work how to look at my body and, and really start to listen and pay attention, you know, know when to pull back, know when to relax. And Chuck Liddell, uh, Chuck Liddell was the first guy I trained with that was Hall of Famer level that would take every Wednesday off. He would go for an easy run on the track. And that was his mid middle of the week day off. And then he would still have a light practice Saturday and nothing on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, man, if he can do that, then we yeah. can do that. Because that, that was throughout his career, or that was when he was training with you a little bit later? Uh, it was. When, is, he, is he in his 40s when he's doing this? Man, he was late 30s, you know. I mean, I trained with him his last two fights of his career. Uh, lived with him down in San Luis Obispo, trained with Coach Hackleman, and mm -hmm. I learned I learned so much from him there, you know. But I don't know I don't know what his training looked like early on in his career. I'm sure he had fine tuned and refined some things over time, but yeah, that that really helped me. And then. You know, you come out of fighting, and it's like, okay, I don't have to be at that level anymore. And it's funny because I hated high-intensity intervals at that point. Yeah. I mean, I hated putting myself through the grinder because I had done it for eight years. So I got into, like, chi running, you know, like slow, nose-breathing, long-distance runs. I yeah. do with my wife. Chi running. Going it's awesome. <laughs> going. There's a book guys, called Chi Running. Guys, watch me go slow. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> the, ma would, the Matrix. You really couldn't even <laughs> call it running. It's more like <laughs> chi, pace, walking, jogging. <laughs> like a moving meditation. Yeah. 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 And uh, so I got into that and got into powerlifting. And, and powerlifting is awesome. You know, like, I still like moving heavy weight. And uh, I was training with Jesse Burdick for quite some time, and really, you know, the guy taught me how to squat, and I found so much beauty in his work because it wasn't just about getting stronger. I mean, I was building mobility at the same time. My squat was getting deeper as I was getting stronger. My body moved better as I was adding strength and size. Um, ultimately, though, still wanting to do jiu-jitsu, I realized, like, there is a point of diminishing returns with the size that I had put on, so started adding in more high-intensity intervals, obviously coming here to on it. 
uh, has been a big change. We've got every weird tool in the fucking yeah. game here, you know, getting in with maces to open up the shoulders, sub scap. I mean, there's so much to the tools. And uh, I still power lift every now and then, not at the same pace that I used to. Uh, I think it's valuable. I mean, people need to pick up heavy shit. Yeah. That, that's a no-brainer, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I really like, you know, employing uh, some of the different, you know, kettlebell snatches, things like that, mace work, and just trying to adopt a little bit of everything so I'm a bit more well-rounded. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then still incorporating high-intensity intervals, which I still don't like, yeah. but it's important. I, a lot of my friends that are getting older really find that only doing a heavy lift, like maybe even twice a month, is enough to maintain their strength without beating themselves up. Yeah, I, I think um, – I forget the guy's name. Doug McGuff, the doctor yeah. uh, who wrote the uh, back Body guy. by Science. The, 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 the back doc? No, yeah, that's I, McGill. McGill. Oh, McGill. I'm sorry, McGill. He's, um, he's the guy that's big on the ARCS trainer. Mm. Uh, I know uh, Bulletproof Dave Asprey has been big on him, but, I mean, a lot of people have been big on him. He talks about, you know, if you go max effort, maybe one every ten days do you need to work out. I'd rather work out just for the sake of getting the euphoria and, and yeah. the pump and feeling yeah, good. Pump, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, man, I enjoy it. So it's not something where I want to pace that three times a month. Mm -hmm. But I like breaking that into different things. You know, It might be jujitsu, It might be yoga. It might be just jumping rope and shadow boxing. It might be a 20-minute high-intensity interval on an assault bike. Yeah. yeah. But just mixing it up that way. Yeah. A lot of people that have been training their whole lives, like they get done competing – but they still want to train every day just because yeah. it's like it's just what they do. Like it's it's who they are. Yeah. They they just enjoy it. Like they don't want to take the day off because they need to recover. They want they want to go in and do something just because that's how they break their day up and it's yeah. like something fun to do. And in a, in a lot of people's cases, it's like where they see their friends. Yeah, but I, don't I go actually to the gym. I don't see yeah. my friends today. Yeah, I actually really struggle talking about working out sometimes because people think that there's some like magic thing. Um, I have some big goal or something. I'm like, no, no, no. I just want to show up and be with my friends and have a real conversation with my body and it's it's really challenging to tell somebody that you don't really care about the result you just want to be there and you yeah. know have things start adding up to to a really healthy life i think that's the the absolute key that most people miss and dan john said that was like one of his biggest tips he could ever give somebody is just show up that's 90 percent of it just show up you're beat up, yeah. just show up. You'll warm up, you'll move your body, you'll feel better yeah. afterwards. You're, you're feeling great, mm -hmm. not sure if you want to max out or just show up. Make yeah. the decision when you're warming up. Like yeah. It doesn't have to be something where it's like, man, all right, I wrote down my entire workout before I got here, and mm -hmm. I'm going to be pissed if I don't get every set and rep in. Yeah. It's like, no, man, just show up. Just I miss my something. number. Yeah. 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 I, I'm reminded by uh, this quote from uh, John Berardi, forever, for everyone, for always. And we get locked in this like psychological position that either causes us to fail or overtrain and eventually like lead to injury. And it's like, oh, I can't, you know, I the the our introduction to training was in you know high school sports, and we trained like so hard. And then when we go to college or you know if we're playing college sports and we train so hard in college, and then we no longer have that allotment of time after that life is done, and we can't even conceptualize how fitness happens if we don't have two hours to commit to it, six days a week you know, 100% effort and like getting over that, I think is kind of the, the secret to, you know, being able to just show up and just like be happy with showing up. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I find that, you know, especially having the podcast and talking with people on Facebook live often with all the questions. And I'm sure you guys know, cause you've been in the game way longer than I have. Nobody, the one thing we're all missing is time. Right. Yeah. And so I know that now I know, and I didn't know this in the past, but now I know I don't have to beat myself up to get results. And so with that, it's really rare that I spend an hour in the gym. The times that I commit an hour to training is for a yoga class that's 90 minutes or a jujitsu class that's 90 minutes. Other than that, with warm-up, mobility, and stretching, and all that stuff pre and post, I'm maybe looking at 40, 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I can get a lot accomplished in that time if I'm efficient with it and I know what I'm going to. And I think there's been a lot of freedom in that because it's not a huge time commitment. Obviously, my desk is right – it's it's in the gym, so I can yeah. just walk right over and get stuff done. But um, I'm out of here in under an hour with 15 to 20 minutes of sauna post-workout. 
That's a pretty sweet deal. I'm about to get one those. of those after this interview. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> yeah, you, you've had a lot of physiologic, like you have a huge foundation where it's like, you know, other people that are looking for results that don't have that physiological foundation. Do you feel like they could commit the same amount of time? And do you feel like that's like the case for someone who's like, I've never worked out before and now this is what I want to do. Are they able to, you know, a- a- achieve and feel and get the results that, you know, somebody like you who's been doing it your whole life and uh, in that same amount of time? Well, I think that consistency is key for anybody, you know, and there's there's no there's no real there's no real science that says if you go past 40 minutes into an hour and a half that you're going to get that many more gains, you know what I'm saying? Like you might be more sore from the workout, but truthfully, I think it's better for people to if they could work out 5 days a week for 30 minutes, that's better than crushing themselves 3 days a week. Yeah. You know, it it just depends what your goal is. I mean, if you are trying to power lift, yeah, by all means, crush it. Get that in, work on mobility, have days off in between, fully recover, all those things. But if the goal is just to move better and to feel better, it's better to do things more consistently, to keep showing up, and to have variety. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Figure out a way to go (laughs) enjoy yourself. Yeah, fitness shouldn't be so damn serious. You (laughs) mentioned uh, training with uh, Hackleman and Chuck Liddell. Some pretty decent mentors you've had in your life. Yeah, I mean, we started. I mean, I'm gonna name drop the shit out of some Do people it. right now. I love, love a name, name drop. Love name drop. Killer. Uh, when I was on the Ultimate Boom. Fighter, big, big nog, <laughs> Nogera. Ultimate was, Fighter, go ahead. Yeah, he was, <laughs> there's one. Start, start the clicker. Yeah. So, big nog was my coach, and uh, he brought in Anderson Silva, who was supposed to come for three days. He stayed for two and a half weeks. Lyoto Machida stayed for three weeks. I mean, oh. we were surrounded by. What season was that? Uh, season eight. And, you know, just very fortunate. And I was a white belt in jiu-jitsu, so truthfully, I didn't pick up half of what I could have as a purple belt or a brown belt. But, you know, just an excellent way to be surrounded by top-tier talent that could teach me a lot and soak that in and know what – I mean, those guys truly embodied what it meant to be a martial artist, not just a fighter, but to have that martial arts mentality. And that was really special because I think that's lost – quite often in today's fight game. You know, these guys really embodied what you think of when you think of, like, a guy like Bruce Lee. Yeah, because Chuck Liddell was a Kyokushin, right? It was, it was not one of his original forms. It was a form of karate of some sort. Yeah, I think it was... It'll he come used to, to just drop bombs on people. Starts with an S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. It's not Kyokushin. No, it starts with an S. I don't know. Yeah, It'll yeah. come to me. But, yeah, that's, that's Hackleman's background. Yeah, he got a black belt. Is that Shotokan? Um, maybe. Karate. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Nerding out on martial arts. <laughs> um, I think what, Chuck Liddell, all I think is like open hooks and big right yeah. hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially in the early days of the UFC when he was just massacring people. Oh, yeah. It's like, what bar did they find him in where he killed everyone? Oh, <laughs> and then you realize like, oh, no, that guy's like legit. Like he's he's been in the game a long time and he's very technical. But, um, yes, yeah, so what uh, – where I know nothing about UFC really. <laughs> I just remember watching that guy <laughs> being like, "Oh God, that hurt." Um, but yeah, d- training with those guys and having the mentors. Like, how much time were you spending with those guys? And what does maybe their day, maybe not the day, but the way that they are throughout their day? Like, you're not just in the gym for a, a you know, an hour, forty minutes, whatever it is. Like, this is a, a lifestyle piece. And what are those guys doing at the top level? What are you doing at the top level when you're when you're in that life? And making it, it's a 24-hour-a-day process from what you eat, how you train, the mentality that you carry with you, um, how much of that stuff is still with you and the way that you're going about, you know, the current current projects you're working on. You know, it's different for everyone. Chuck and a lot of the guys at AKA have uh, people do their food for them. You know, they get prepared meals. I never had that kind of finances to, to throw that out there. Plus, I also knew better than most of the people making the food uh, just because it was a passion of mine. So and I, don't, I like being in the kitchen. I like making my own food and making it fresh, not doing meal prep for fucking seven days worth of food on yeah. a Sunday. And, uh, but that's how, that's how they would eat, you know, scheduled massages, stretching, those kind of things. And really it's just about incorporating as much in your off time for active recovery as possible. You know, the guys that just sit on their ass and don't do anything, they're not getting better. They're not helping their body heal as fast. And I think at the very least, you know, getting some body work in between practices has become – the norm and the standard now for high level guys um and again i couldn't you know it's not like i could shell out a bunch of cheese for massage therapists to come over to the house so i'd be <laughs> digging through becoming a supple leopard and getting up against the wall for some uh super couch stretches and things like that and just figuring out different ways i can open up my body using myself you know and i think that was that's been an absolute necessity especially being done with fighting 
how can I open up my body and really work on myself without having to pay somebody a good grip of cheese yeah. you know, to get that done? I think that's been that's been critical. Um, but, you know, I mean, people do have to they have to have fun. They have to learn how to play. They have to figure out what works for them. And that could mean, uh, you know, it could mean video games for one guy. It could mean just sitting around with your family and playing games. It could be watching your favorite TV show, whatever. But you got to have some type of downtime. When I was fighting out in California, we'd go to the beach all the time. You know, it was a 45-minute drive to Santa Cruz, and my wife and I would go there and, and just really unwind and get in the water. And, and, you know, it's nice and cold, too. So we were getting some of those benefits before yeah. even learning about Wim Hof. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think just a way to unplug, you know, a way to really – reset the mind to, to it can't all be fighting you can't always be thinking about that so how you differentiate disassociate and pull your mind out of that sphere is important it's important for anybody to learn that with work because how yeah. often do we take our work home with us mm -hmm. you know I, I learned that from ben greenfield who i i find to be a huge mentor but when i was at his house i was at I, I which kinda, is awesome by the way yeah he's he's yeah. a great dude but i was i was asking him, i was like man i had this idea that you were kind of like uh, captain fantastic with vigo mortensen you know you'd have your kids like completely off grid and all that and he's like no you know i was homeschooled till you know through k through 12 and i realized like i don't play well with others so my kids they go to a private school i get all my work done at four so when they show up at home i'm 100 percent invested in them and that's where I teach them the stuff that they don't learn in school. I teach them bow hunting. I teach them how to forage for medicinal mushrooms and different edible plants. And that's where I get to be dad. So I really took that to heart. And now when I get home, I'm not on my phone. I'm not looking at emails or checking the Slack app for those of us in the business world now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not looking in at Why any are, of that stuff. Yeah. My, my phone goes on mute. I'll take a look at it before I go to bed and then just throw it on airplane mode. And that's about it. You know, I get to be full-time dad when I get home and that's that not only gives more to my son but it gives more to me because I'm not pulled in six different directions at once I can really just be present with him and kind of unplug from office life which is oddly what I have signed up for <laughs> <laughs> uh, a second ago you mentioned cold water and the, the benefits that you mentioned the benefits but there are benefits to that and you mentioned Wim Hof and then earlier you mentioned uh, getting into the sauna as a part of the end of your workout like w w what have you found with using heat stress if you want to call it that um, what, what have you found as, as the benefits to you personally for doing cold water and or sauna work yeah you know i mean i i had really found out about wim hof on tim ferris and then again on rogan's and gotten taken the deep dive on that uh obviously when i was with adam down at xpt they were really big into that you know you start the day with uh contrast so they've got a sauna that's juiced up to 220 degrees fahrenheit mm -hmm. three ice baths at 33 degrees you know, and you do three to five minutes in the ice bath, 10 to 15 minutes in the sauna for three rounds on an empty stomach. That's how you start the day. It feels Ooh. pretty damn good. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't have a sauna at the house. but It's impossible not to wake up <laughs> with, yeah. with that setup. You are awake. I'd, yeah. I'd, wake up at, I'd, I'd wake up before those, and he'd have us doing monkey chanting before you guys would show up. And we're, like, in the basement doing monkey chanting. I'd damn near pass out from breathing. It'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> you have to like show let's get turned the, on. Let's get turned on. You'll have to show me the monkey chant later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, don't know, sure. I don't know anything about the monkey yeah. chant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should well, we do right now it was <laughs> so it, we we would get in the breathing yeah. we'd get in the breathing we and then he'd start making a noise we're like ha da 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 and we would start doing it we'd just start copying them and then in like in a group of like 10 people we all started like synchronicity like at the same time changing our exact breath tone mm. and it was it was like we didn't even know what was happening next and then we'd all be in a different breath and like a different chant and it was like you know, and uh, there's these Balinese monkey chanting, and that's kind of where they got it from. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Half the time I'm in a room like that, I'm wondering if, like, the whole thing's a big fucking joke or, like, should, like how, much, how much should I be invested yeah. in what well, we're doing right now? Like, like me, am I being punked right now? Right. We're, like, we're, oh. we're in there, and it's like, to my right is, you know, this actor, this 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 guy, this guy, and they're all like, la 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 ha la 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 ha la 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 And I'm, like, looking around like, Holy shit! I'm like doing ha la 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 next to like Superman over here, like what the you know? Like, well, they're bought in. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I, I was at a conference one time, and, and we were doing things like that. And then the guy told everyone to sit up straight in their chairs, and then he goes, "Repeat after me." And, every, and he was like, mm -hmm. "So now the whole room's going." Mm -hmm. And then he's like, "Okay, now sway back and forth." And everyone starts swaying back and forth, going. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, and everyone's kind of everyone's kind of looking around, like, like should I be doing this right now? And then he's like, okay, now now repeat after me, 
We are not a cult. <laughs> <laughs> we are not a cult. <laughs> and everyone's fucking laughing. We're like, okay, okay, we were being fun. Just, like, well, just <laughs> pickpocketed you while you were swaying back and forth. Like, where'd all the money go? Yeah, did you uh, did you feel it. better when you were doing the humming? Uh, well, I, I think at the time I was like, I was so like, just being like, okay, what the, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> is that, this when they serve the cool? I don't think I was feeling better. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was more confused. Because there, there is yeah. some science on humming and chanting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A mind-heart yeah. connection. Yeah, man. And yeah. so what happens is because you're slowing down your exhale, you're dipping into parasympathetic. So you literally shift the state of your being simply by slowing down the exhale. And most people will teach you in yoga like four seconds in, eight seconds out. Like Four pranayama. seconds in, seven seconds yeah, hold, yeah. eight seconds out. Those kind of things all shift you into parasympathetic. But the longer the exhale, the more blood flow you get to the brain. Mm -hmm. So if you're going, hmm, yeah. you're literally getting more Max. blood to the brain. Yeah. Okay. So Max if you are bought yeah. in, obviously there's some placebo there. But if yeah. you're bought in, then you, you can start to feel that and sense that. Right. As far as the hot and cold, man, I mean, they're two of the easiest biohacks on earth. They really are. We're designed to be to have temperature extremes. You know, we go from climate-controlled cars to climate-controlled office to climate-controlled home, and we never experienced that. So as far and, – and then going back to time, I mean, I've followed Don, Dr. Rhonda Patrick for years. Obviously, she's big into the sauna. Mm -hmm. There's tons – I mean, it just goes up exponentially the longer you're in it. So 60% drop in all-cause mortality if you're in there seven days a week for an hour. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But, again, I'm not doing shit for seven days a week, an hour at a time, yeah. and I can get a lot of the benefits from five to ten minutes in the cold bath and as far as, like, hacking meditation, like, to anybody that's ever done a cold bath, you realize you can't think about a damn thing else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not thinking you about your so wife. Present. Yeah, you're not thinking about your kid being a jerk. You're not thinking about your boss yelling at you. Yeah. Like, you are as fucking in the zone. And it's an, it's an immediate hack. And you have to slow down because if you're huffing and puffing, mm -hmm. you're not doing Wim Hof breathing in the cold because yeah. that moves the cold around. That yeah. makes you more cold. You'll create and shock right. in yeah. a way, too. Yeah. yeah, and you're panicking in the fight, right? Yep. So you have to stay calm and present in the fight. And by doing that, slowing the breathing down, breathing through the nose, mm -hmm. you dip into parasympathetic. Right. So, And there's a, there's a ton of science on how much it raises dopamine and adrenaline, which is obviously feel-good neurochemicals but, but boosts the immune system. So lowering inflammation, I mean, you just you kill so many birds with one stone. And there's fat loss. So it's like that's a cute side effect that I'll take, you know, yeah. as a bonus. Yeah, Stephen Kotler talks a lot about that. Like all types of, of extreme physical stressors are extremely presencing. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to have some type of, of meditation without really trying to meditate. Yeah, you hack flow. And one of the beauties, I was just talking with this guy, Casper, who's one of Wim Hof's uh, head trainers. He came out from the Netherlands to be on the show and on the On It podcast. And he was talking about how – the things that we do, and I, we know this from jujitsu, Adam, but when you put yourself in a shitty spot, when you put yourself in a stressor, the more times you navigate those waters calmly, the easier that extrapolates out to everyday stressors in life, right? So yeah. if I go into the cold bath, which is an immediate stressor and shock to the body, mm -hmm. and I can learn to control my breathing and be present and find stillness in that, mm -hmm. that really does go to everything, every other possible situation where I can find stress. If I can tie in that memory into my brain because neurons that fire together wire, to, wire together. If I just take those deep inhalations in and out of the nose, the next time somebody cuts me off in traffic or my wife blows up for not doing something I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's, never happens. That's yeah. a, it never happens. She's You're an angel. Here. She's an You're angel. on your own on that on, one. I'm speaking <laughs> about other never people. never felt that. Other people's <laughs> relationships. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, the, the body remembers. You know, I take that nice deep breath in, in through the nose, out through the nose, slowly on the exhale, and it remembers the calmness inside the storm remembers the eye of the hurricane and that shit goes to every possible avenue for stress so there's there's so much to that and that's that's it's pretty easy to get that dialed in you know i was spending 60 bucks to 80 bucks on ice every time i spent <laughs> way more than 500 bucks on ice in my lifetime and kelly Sturette and matt vincent were telling me about just get a chest freezer get it on craigslist and ultimately there's too many hunters here in austin and texas so I just bought a brand new one, but it was 550 free delivery from HomeDepot.com. No affiliation with them. I'm not throwing out a sponsor here. <laughs> I've got an affiliate link. Code, Home uh, Depot, code, so uh, get your two by four. Code word Kingsboo at checkout. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, get, I get 10%. They're, They're like, who? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was, you know, but, but having that, never having to spend money on ice, it's energy star efficient. It's not taking a ton. It hasn't added much to my electricity bill at all. And when you only plug it in like a couple hours before, right? We plug it in for I think six hours, three days a week. Got it. And that'll that'll drop it into the 30s. My wife and I'll warm it back up to the 50s, and we just we vary the time that we're in there based on how cold it is. But it gets the job done every time. 
So she does a lot of this with you? The cold oh, yeah. water immersion stuff? Yeah, man. I mean, it's so beneficial for the mitochondria. And, and talking about longevity, like what do we do for longevity, mm-hmm. we understand everything looks at metabolism. You know, cancer is a metabolic theory. Is, is beautiful, right? Then we can begin to look at things differently. And a lot of people don't want to go into a ketogenic diet, but maybe intermittent fasting can be something that everyone does that has the similar benefits or better. Right. And and certainly accomplishable, like if we narrow down that eating window yeah. and kind of reverse that, we're not designed to wake up and eat all the way until we go to sleep. Little trick doing that, combining it with some type of temperature extreme, we're influencing the mitochondria and that influences all of our energy systems. You know, that's that's more cognitive energy. People talk about falling flat on their face in the afternoon. You probably ate a shitty lunch, you know, or you didn't get good sleep, or your body's not tuned in to the environment. So getting some cold first thing in the morning can keep you energized all day long, you know. And yeah. that's – there's so many little yeah. tricks that we have that we just – we fail to implement because we know it's hard. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll speak on your abilities of, you know, practicing what you preach, which is, you know, everybody – you know, out of the of the XPT uh, cast at at that time, was so impressed with your ability to the cold, the heat, the water for a guy your size. It was like something that you were, like you know, and then seeing you on the ground and being mobile, and you obviously you know you 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 put a lot into it. And it, it, what's interesting is, is like how much of that I'd like to know came from that knowledge came from either you know. Uh, preventative or reco- or trying to recover from something. So it's like we learn the most from our injuries and, you know, being a fighter, being at USC, and you were like, oh, I had to learn mobility. I had to... Was it injury and that stuff that kind of prompted you, like, down this road? Was there, like, injuries? Or was it you seeing people being injured and being like, uh, I need to figure this out? No, it was it was definitely my own. You know, right when I got into becoming a supple leopard, I had chronic knee pain from football, and I thought I was going to need surgery, but it was mid-camp. And I was, you know, we, we have the shittiest insurance on earth in the UFC. So it was like, <laughs> yeah. wait till the fight, then tell them you hurt your knee in the fight. Yes. That way you can get it, you can get uh, surgery paid for. Yep. Right. And what's funny is, you know, I'm, I'm four weeks into camp and uh, somebody hooked me up with the book. I think Tom, my buddy Tom Lawler and uh, started doing a lot of the different, you know, voodoo floss and the uh, lacrosse balls behind the knee where you sit on the ground and bring your heel to your ass for two minutes each side. Mm-hmm. Those are fun. All of a sudden, <laughs> fucking, all of a sudden, Ow. my knee pain's gone. Yeah. You know, and it didn't come back. It stayed gone, and I still had a. I still a, let's take a look at the MRI, and they're like, "Well, you're bone on bone. You're gonna need uh, some type of knee replacement down the road. You're gonna have arthritis." But guess what? There is zero pain. The more that I keep those knees working through Fuck boot floss yeah, yeah, yeah. and shit like that, it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. You know, maybe a little yeah. bone broth and maybe some mobility, and then I have no pain. Mm-hmm. So have you had it X-rayed since that? All that. You know, to no, see, no, like, any regeneration of any no, sort? No MRIs done, but, I mean, I have I have literally have no pain in that knee from that. You know, it's like as long as I keep moving properly and keep that oxygenated and get the blood flow in there, I'm good to go. And so that was the first, like, there's there's moments in time that you have where things click all together and you realize, like, oh, this is a lifelong practice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think having tools like that, the more tools we have in the toolbox, the r- more we realize, like, we can fix ourselves. We can yeah. heal. And I've, I've needed surgery. I needed a surgery on my right shoulder. Becoming a supple leopard was something I leaned heavily on to get back full range of motion. You know, yeah. like there's, there's, there's a time and a place for surgery, but I think the better we are at preventing that, the, the easier life is. You know, yeah. that was a one-year layoff with the shoulder surgery. That was no joke. So I think um, injury definitely created the necessity to learn that, that stuff. But, you know, when it comes to the cold, like just listening to Wim Hof, who's pretty damn charismatic, you know, he says feeling is understanding, feeling is believing. Just try it. And you start yeah. doing 50 round or 50, 50 Wim Hof breaths all the way in, halfway out for five rounds, it shifts your neurochemistry. Yeah. Like you feel high. That's why he's got the shirts get high on your own supply. Like it, <laughs> it works to change the neurochemistry. And you dip into the cold, all of a sudden you're, you're less sore. You feel better. You have energy throughout the day, and it resets the circadian rhythm so you sleep better. You can go to bed earlier. I used to stay up till midnight or 1 a.m. every night, and I couldn't fall asleep. Now I can go to bed at 9 or 10, and part of that's having a kid, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, don't, don't reset the circadian yeah. rhythm. Like, just God. When is bedtime? Er, er, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh. the, the, the kids will uh, – I find myself sometimes, like, Doug's, just, Doug just had one. Anders is about to have his first. My life's about to be over. And, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's just <laughs> about to just begin. Just starting it's just about and to about to be over. At the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. But, I mean, it, it's, it's, I'll be, like, laying down on the couch with the kids watching a movie at, like, 7 o'clock, and I'm passing out now. You know, it's just like, 
oh my god kids holy shit yeah. you're exhausting they're, they're a ball of energy <laughs> um we're gonna take a little break when we get back you're talking about uh the hot and cold but this is kind of just the surface level of the experimentation you do on yourself to test everything that's out there yeah we're we'll gonna go dig deep. into it let's do it cool strong coffee company is a community built by people like you people that take the time to educate and to apply all things that matter whether you're in the gym the office or at home we want to help make you better introducing our full rich instant nutritional energy drink the cafe latte visit strongcoffeecompany.com use dbs20 to receive 20 percent off today welcome back to barbell shrug we're here at on it gym kyle kingsbury talking about some human optimization you are the test dummy <laughs> to everything you're doing to yourself. The guinea pig, The yeah. guinea pig. Don't take that the wrong way. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Some of it's probably dumb, more dummy than not. But, um, <laughs> yeah, if, if this process starts at the, at the very easy buy-in of hot and cold, um, the, the ice baths, maybe getting in the sauna every day, 10, 15 minutes, just to kind of start to adapt to these external stressors. What's kind of the, what's kind of the next level for you, and, and where can people take this? Well, I mean, there's really no limit to, to biohacking as a term, which I think is kind of a, a silly-ass term. But, I mean, um, you know, when I think of biohacking, obviously there's there's hot and cold temperature stuff. That's really just ancestral living, you know. If, if I'm thinking of, like, truly biohacking, maybe that would look like something we're doing now with the vitamin IV treatments. And we've partnered with Dr. Craig Conover out of um, South Carolina, and he's, he's amazing. He's a guy that works with ben, with ben Greenfield and a few other guys that I can't mention. And, uh, you know, we're doing NAD plus IV treatment, which is really cutting edge. And, uh, you know, anytime I do something cutting edge for the life hack of the week through on it, everyone's like, yeah, put your fucking tin cap on. And you know, that kind of, there's, there's resistance <laughs> there. There's resistance when I put on trans direct cranial stem on the dome. But I mean, everything that I'm doing and promoting is stuff that I actually do. And it's also stuff that is backed by science. Otherwise I wouldn't, toy around with it you know so i mean darpa i don't know if you guys remember that uh rogan talking about radio lab doing a thing called nine volt nirvana in 2014 mm -mm. it's pretty cool they talked about um this reporter went to train with darpa for a sniper drill and she had never shot a gun in her life and they hooked her up with a with a sniper rifle or maybe not a sniper i think it was just a um whatever the uh whatever the military yeah I'm, like i'm 16 there like we a, go yeah. yeah so she's got the m16 and it's and it's full weight even though it's not shooting real rounds and it's uh i think 20 20 targets throughout and it's supposed to last 10 minutes and she goes into total panic and hits maybe two targets then they they hook her brain up and juice it full of the fucking oh, electricity dude. oh yeah she heard of this and heard now people 20. are doing it on their own yeah well that's where the video gamers are trying yeah. to start make their own stuff and Crazy. there's no real limit like to that the, halo neuroscience type. yeah halo yeah halo yeah. halo's an advanced version of that so um and you can use that for many different things i mean people are using it to learn second languages people are losing it using it for balance training or learning um new physical requirements, which would be something like sniper training. But DARPA's been using it. I mean, if the military's investing money in it and they've been doing it for four years uh, at least. If, you, if we're finding out about it's it. It's got some credibility, yeah. right? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I get some slack for things like that when I recommend them. But um, the low-tech stuff, you know, the people seem to gravitate towards that more from our community. So if I show, you know, a simple farmer walk finisher, they're like, yeah, all right, I can buy into that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, the NAD plus treatment is a big one. And again, that, that goes back to how we influence the mitochondria. It really, it really pays dividends there. If I think of something like a dietary change, like going keto, there's, it's funny because usually people that talk about it, it's like the Holy grail. It has to be done. It's the best thing ever. And I don't want to sound like, um, you know, a total evangelist and, and, and preacher when it comes to that. But, I mean, having taken quite a few lumps playing football since I was 10 and, and then fighting professionally as a light heavyweight in the same division as guys like Chuck Liddell, I took a fair amount of beatings. And I've never felt my brain turn on the way that it has from going low carb and doing a ketogenic diet. Mm. That That's just – that's why I keep circling back to it. It's not something I stay in year-round. I don't believe it's something for everyone. Um, certainly not if you if – you, you know, you follow a guy like Weston A. Price and you look at, you know, different indigenous cultures and what they ate. It's pretty wide variety. You know, if you're closer to the equator, that's probably smaller prey, chicken and fish, and a lot more carbohydrates. And those people 
probably aren't designed to do well on a high fat, low carb diet. But if you've got ancestry from Northern Europe and different parts that are closer to the poles where yeah. it's colder, at least three months a year you went without carbohydrates because they weren't yeah. getting shipped in from Panama and Mexico. <laughs> they right? weren't? You can't, you <laughs> can't get berries from Mexico yeah. Amazon. year around. There was Amazon. no Apple. There was no Amazon. <laughs> well, yeah. And there was no refrigeration. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, you think about it just in terms like that, it's like, all right, maybe this is a key to metabolic flexibility. Maybe this is a key to a lot of the health problems that come down to insulin resistance, like type 2 diabetes, uh, even type 3 diabetes, which they're calling Alzheimer's and Parkinson's dementia, any of these things that we have seen skyrocket you know, and most of the people listening to this show are probably in pretty good shape and don't need to worry about that. But at the same time, from a genetic standpoint, I read Wired to Eat by Rob Wolf. Great and book. just to start looking at my own, like, wh- what is a good carb versus a bad carb? If I'm going to eat carbohydrates, I should know which carbs are good for me and which ones are causing inflammation and weight gain. And surprisingly, there was quite a few carbohydrates that I didn't tolerate well, mm. uh, white rice being the main culprit. But I can have a plate of sweet potatoes and yams covered in honey, and I look perfect. When I'm you say you don't, <laughs> there it is. When Boom. you say you don't tolerate them well, what, what do you, what do you get mean? some sweet potatoes? I mean, <laughs> I mean, so checking postprandial blood glucose, you know, I would see it skyrocket, like way past pre pre diabetic level, mm-hmm. like, and and that's two hours after you do a blood glucose reading, you know, like a diabetic would. I had already been doing that for blood ketones from doing the ketogenic diet. And never really saw a reason to look at carbohydrates until I read Wired to Eat. And I was like, oh, this makes sense. If I'm going to eat carbohydrates, I should know which ones are inflammatory and in an issue and which ones are not. Because, you know, just, just in the studies he did N equals 1 with him and his wife, he saw that he can't eat white rice. His wife can eat as much white rice as she wants, and she's fine. Hummus, out of 800 people, over 50%. Hummus, you would never think to cause blood sugar spikes because of the fiber and the protein and the fat content, which all is supposed to slow down blood sugar Mm -hmm. but that's not the case over 50 percent of the population that was studied had a huge blood sugar spike that put them in a pre-diabetic level so Mm. really knowing what's right and what's wrong and then also knowing like okay so i can't eat white rice but maybe after i crush myself in the gym it's okay to get the blood sugar spike for the anabolic window all that kind of stuff if you buy into that yeah and that's okay if i want to make my insulin jump through the roof for a recovery aspect Mm. so Was, was the hummus due to the like the chickpea or was it due to like the canola oil and the oils that they use inside a hummus yeah, good, you, good hummus they're going to use olive oil only but okay. i mean i think it was just more to do with the population didn't tolerate that those carbohydrates well and that's probably because the 800 people i think were studied i think it was done here in the states so i'm willing to bet in you know greece and the mediterranean and different places where hummus is quite popular that they can get away with hummus a little bit better mm-hmm. similarly to you know you look at why is white rice an issue for so many people, but it's not for the Okinawans and the Japanese and the Chinese? Well, those people have been eating it longer. Yeah, like the Chinese I mean, I'm study. sure they are yeah. adapted to eat white rice and not have issues. So I think just figuring out what's right for you, because there's no one right diet that's right for everybody, but that takes some due diligence and a little homework. Do you yeah, I mean, if you look in a textbook and you look at, like, potatoes versus, versus hummus or, or just some type of bean – Typically, the the values for how they're going to spike your blood sugar for potatoes is going to be like 98 out of 100 versus beans are going to be like 25 out of 100 as far as how it's going to spike your blood sugar. Um, But those are are averages. There's going to be a bell curve and a spectrum there of how you respond to it. So unless you actually test yourself, you're going to have no idea how you respond to it. Yeah, you can't really can't go based off what everyone else is doing. And you really can't just say like most of my ancestry, I think, is from the equator. I can do better with carbs. Most of my ancestry is from, uh, you know, Scotland, so I should do better with the higher fat meals. You know, like we're all, I shouldn't say we're all, but a lot of, a lot of people that are here in the States are some form of mutt, you know, and what you take, like if, if my parents had five kids, every one of us would look different genetically. Every one of us would have differences in carb tolerances. Just because we have the same parents does not mean we take on the same traits. And that's why taking a deeper dive into what's right for you is really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, when resist, you know, like, I don't know when it was that I first started hearing the term being thrown around maybe like three years ago, but resistant starches, mm-hmm. right? So like yeah. feeding your gut biome and, and everything. And, you know, the three fo- the two foods are the highest in resistant starches, like cold white rice or like potatoes and like That's, potato yeah. starches. Those are, are So those are different forms of resistant starch. Um, you have like R, R2, R3. You know, resistant starch that's cooked and cooled would be one class. And, you know, yeah. obviously sushi rice falls into that category. That doesn't create a huge jump. It still is not 
I wouldn't call that a health food for me. Right. But if I'm, I've put in work and I know I'm going to eat sushi at night or go to a, all you can eat sushi, I'm damn sure going to crush it in the gym that day mm-hmm. just to mitigate some of that and really have my muscles and liver screaming for glycogen restoration. Mm-hmm. Then I'm okay. I'm covered some of the bases. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of that, looking at raw potato starch and um, green banana powder or green plantains, green bananas, that's going to be in a different category, resistant starch as well. And there's a lot of science that shows that helps feed the microbiome. But the truth is, in my own studies, because, I mean, after I, I did a 50K ultra in Jesus. ketosis, it was great. I was 238 pounds, yeah. finished the race, That's no a problems. <laughs> it's a large person to I go that far. Kyle's I was running. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, look at, everyone is like, man, there's a bodybuilder running sure out here. Sure wasn't 50 He doesn't steps. have a camelback. <laughs> but, it, but it was funny because I'm not a bodybuilder, but to, to – to distance runners, yeah, I looked like King Kong. <laughs> and, um, Godzilla. I was the only guy who intelligently did not have a camelback. Everyone else had a camelback. And so what happened was I had already had some bit of candida and parasites in my body. And uh, when you run that long and you don't have enough water, the body will start pulling from different places like the intestines, which can immediately cause leaky gut syndrome. So mm. I had candida and parasites go systemic. Oh. And it was really bad. It took me a year to battle through oh. that. And one thing I found was raw potato starch in particular feeds the bad guys as well as the good guys. So there are some things that you have to play with and learn. And I had to learn that the hard way because I couldn't put my finger on it why I kept getting head colds. And it was every time I would load up with raw yeah. potato starch. Wow. So there are, there are some things to that. It's not like, oh, this feeds good bacteria, you know. X plus Y equals Z for everyone. It doesn't necessarily. There's many variables that play into those things. And we find that out now. You know, I've interviewed Dr. Michael Ruscio, who's a speaker at Paleo FX. Um, I, he just wrote a book. I forget what the name of it is. But he's he's not only a gut specialist, he's an autoimmune specialist. And one of the things we were getting into is that we're really in the infancy of understanding how the microbiome works. And it's it's you can't just look at a population of Africans and say, they have this in their gut, so that's what we should have to be healthy. It's bullshit. They have, they're also grounding every day. They're yeah. immersed in soil yeah. based organisms. You know, their, their water isn't as clean as ours, and they do fine with that. You're literally taught when you're there, like, don't step on their grass if you're American, because you'll get, like, a parasitic infection. I mean, like, we're that different. Yeah. That yeah. we'll, like, if we step on grass, we'll get a parasite. When yeah. I was in Africa, it was like, don't take yeah. your shoes off. I assumed. <laughs> I was like, oh. Yeah. oh. When I was on safari, <laughs> I assumed that I could just go, drink the water and our guide was like don't even try you will die right away <laughs> there's, there's no right like away. yeah there's no i can't get you out of the jungle quick enough if you drink the water here like we are we're not adapted for <laughs> the earth we live on anymore yeah um, i think it's really important too though uh that people understand like all these things that you're talking about and um they come with a context and you have to have this very basic level of like hormone levels when you eat a carbohydrate what what happens what is protein doing for your body how what is what is fat doing to your body and then we can start adjusting and turning the dials on these things because you're really talking about the compounding effect of these these tiny little things that you're already adding to a system that's been built for years and years and how you're able to really dial it in specifically to you um and I think that comes just – there's so much learning that goes on at the basic level before in, – in, in the systems that you implement into your life before we start really dialing into, like, am I going to go keto? It's one of the things that – it's really strange that happens in nutrition. It was, it was like – one of the things I noticed in the paleo diet when it first came out was a lot of the testing gets done on cancer patients, type 2 diabetes, and then all of a sudden a bunch of performance athletes are in here – killing themselves and they haven't had a carbohydrate in a year and they're wondering why they're so burnt out um how how do you kind of deliver that message to people and you're the things you're doing may not be the best for others so what does that conversation look like yeah and i get asked that question a lot i think there's a couple things one if you if the goal is weight loss it's it's a, it's hard to argue against the ketogenic diet at least periodically yeah. you know at least for an eight to twelve week stretch and then doing some type of carbohydrate backloading after that. Once you've become keto adapted and your body has metabolic flexibility, you've lowered some insulin resistance. And going back to hormones, we're really talking about insulin here. Yeah. You know, if we eat every day, we start the day with carbohydrates, you know, for breakfast, carbohydrates for lunch, carbohydrates as a snack before dinner. I mean, we, we put ourselves on this insulin roller coaster where blood sugar skyrockets, insulin tries to match, it drops blood sugar and then we're starved for carbohydrates again right so one of the things we talk about in own the day own your life by aubrey marcus 
just released April 17th. Boom. New York Times bestseller list. Plug, Dang. plug, plug. Uh, <laughs> bang, uh, bang. One of the things we talk about is, is at the very least, you want to do carbohydrate backloading. At the very least, you want to have either skip breakfast or have an optimized coffee, you know, loaded with fat and protein. And then for lunch, you can have, like Mark Sisson calls it, a big-ass salad. Keep that lower in carbohydrates or, or some type of food that's lower in carbohydrates, higher in fat. You can get a shake, make your own shake, whatever the case is, or just snack on macadamia nuts, which are really high in great fats. And then save your carbohydrates for night after you've moved throughout the day, after you've had you know, a good workout, and your body is literally craving that carbohydrate. Yeah. And then you're not going to put that on as fat. You'll be burning fat for fuel throughout the day. You don't have the roller coaster going on with insulin and carbohydrates. And I think that's a great first place to start for people. When you're talking about athletes that are getting into a ketogenic diet, obviously, you know, Steve Finney and Jeff Volick were working with long-distance runners. And they saw, hey, it works great for those guys. But people that burn things glycolytically, I have a lot of fighters ask me, like Matt Brown and different people, can I do this in fighting? And I'm like, maybe, yeah. maybe not. You know, like it's good in between fight camps to help the brain heal and lower inflammation. But when you're burning that much carbohydrates, at the very least, you have to do something like targeted keto, which I think his name's Louis Villasenor, the yep. keto gains guy. Yep. He's been really big on that. And that can range He's based on how hard the workout is. Yep. It might be 10 grams of glucose for one person. It might be 20 grams of a different carbohydrate for somebody else, depending on how hard the workout is. But taken at the beginning of the workout, not an hour before, you can help balance that need for glycogen in a high-intensity interval training session, jiu-jitsu, things like that. Um, it's something I've been playing with more to find the right range, so I'm still making ketones at night. But once you find that, you can have the best of both worlds. You know, it's not have your cake and eat it too. It's more like have your beet, beet juice extract with yeah. the workout and, and then – stay stay making ketones by night and that's really the happy medium for me where i don't have to worry about added inflammation just for the sake of being able to to deadlift more or yeah. something like that yeah. you know i've done that before and it worked out really really well for me like i used to i used to compete in weightlifting in the 94 kilo class weighing 207 when you weigh in uh which you don't have as much time to weigh in for weightlifting as you do for mma you don't got that, that 24 hour period usually but but then I, i'd fight welterweight at 170 i only had eight amateur fights but when i would I'd be bouncing back and forth between these two weight classes all the time so i'd make big cuts to fight for MMA, and and I would almost always only have like the bulk of my carbohydrates, like 80% of my carbohydrates for the day were just like in my workout shake, and that that helped me have the intensity that I needed for training. But then the rest of the day, my, my calories and my carbohydrate content was really really low, and it worked out beautifully. I, on the other hand, completely messed up my career by following Lauren Cordier's you know, the, the, the athlete, <laughs> oh, the yeah. paleo diet for athletes. Yeah. yeah. I read so, that. So you're just cramming raisins down your throat. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was, I was ketogenic <sighs> almost since 22 years old through like 28 and then like only doing like what Lauren Cordian said and just, you know, completely being, you know, having like adrenal fatigue and like I'd hit second round and I'd feel like my hands weighed a thousand pounds because I had no glucose left in me. You know, it was very, uh, I wish I would have, you know, dove deeper into it before experimenting it with like a professional career at the same time you know yeah, it's like, yeah I, that that is tough but i mean that's there's that there's, was the learning <laughs> there's self-experimentation and learning and you know i think there's just more there's more great information out now we're really in a beautiful time i i i tell people to, to get the keto reset diet by mark sisson because it's the most up-to-date piece of material that i've read where they dispel a lot of the myths you know can women do it will it influence hormonal changes and around you know the monthly cycle around having kids yes but only if you're going to the extreme like i never advocate a zero carb diet that's bullshit you yeah. know that means you're not even getting cruciferous vegetables in like kale and cauliflower and broccoli and and i think that's another key miss you know a lot of people associate uh, a low carb diet with the atkins diet which is Jimmy dean sausage and boatloads of shitty protein and meat you know, if you're still Jeez. getting grass-fed animals <laughs> and, and things that are anti-inflammatory, you know, if you can get away with not all cheese is created equal. They talk about that in The Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry. Most cheese comes from Holstein cows that are black and white cows because they produce the most milk. Mm. They create casein, A1 casein, which is inflammatory. That's a case of morphine. When they talk about cheese being morphinogenic, it, re it literally will fit into opiate receptors in the brain. It's addictive. But Southern European cows create A2 casein. And for a lot of people that don't have a lactose intolerant, they're, they're just fine with Southern European cow cheese. I myself am fine with that. I don't get stiff joints. I don't get beat up from it. 
So there's there's different resources we can find to, to really fine tune what's right for us. But ultimately, what is your goal? You know, you have to understand the why for anything. If your goal is to be the strongest you can possibly be in powerlifting, why would you do a ketogenic diet? You don't need yeah. to. You know, but if your goal is to cut weight in between competitions, then yeah, go keto and come back to carbs and do be better for it because your body will utilize those carbohydrates better. Yeah, oh. there's a time and a place for everything. I haven't read I haven't read Mark Sisson's uh, the keto reset, but is it kind of does it go in the direction of leptin? Kind of like uh, like getting the leptin cycle moving again? Yeah, yeah. There's I mean there's he he touches on the science from a lot of things, but the thing that I really appreciated about it was you know. Women can get away with that with moderate carbohydrates. Like, and because they can get away with more carbohydrates, like my wife can add 80 carbs a, a day and still produce one millimolar of ketones. You know, like she's still deep in ketosis nutritionally mm. at 80 grams a day. Oh. You know, whereas that that would be far higher than most men can handle. At the same time, they look at things like um, typically if I was to you know have a bad meal and get out of ketosis, what would be the best way to get back in to shorten that four day span and cut it to a day? Most people would say go for, you know, like even Tim Ferriss has said, like go for a long walk. Walk for four or five miles. That'll help you burn fat and get your ketones up. And the truth is it'll get ketones higher because you're just burning fat, but that doesn't really get you back into ketosis quicker. High-intensity intervals do. Yeah. And you won't see your ketones go up because the muscle's burning ketones while you're doing that workout. Yeah. But what's the fastest way? It's to dump all that glycogen out. Yeah. Get it out of the muscle. Get it out of the liver and force your body to go back into ketosis quicker. Mm-hmm. And if you've done it for – eight to 12 weeks and you're keto adapted, then you shouldn't have a problem making that change happen much faster. And so that, that gives people a little leeway, like, hey, I want to go out to eat with my friends and I don't want to be a dick and I don't get like six tablespoons of olive oil added to my shitty salad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you can have some fun. You can live life as a human being and really not pay the consequences for it. I feel like up until this point, you, you've, you've already mentioned like dozens of authors and, and you understand their research. Like, is that something that you you did on your own like you just read a lot on your own you're always doing research did you actually have an academic background in in some of this stuff going through college and whatnot college was communication and sociology and a little bit of philosophy and it's funny because podcasting now i i i kind of do use my degree for for what i'm doing as a podcast host Mm -hmm. uh that was like a football player schedule yeah that was like a football player that that was the football players whenever i hear a football player like a soccer player let's keep you eligible they're like i'm in i'm an english major (laughs) you know like (laughs) communication specialist yeah it's like what what does that even mean i have a (laughs) 2.51 perfect (laughs) that's the hundredth yeah Yeah. (laughs) exactly i'm above 2.5 um But no, you know, I mean, it was really post-college infighting where I decided, like, I think the first thing was I read, I read How to Eat Moving Me Healthy by Paul Check. Yeah. Oh, I, did a, I did an elimination diet, realized I was gluten intolerant, and that changed so much for me. Mm. And I was like, fuck, man, if that one little change can happen from food alone, that really planted the seed for me to want to learn more. Mm. And, you know, through fighting, you know, having... I, could literally look at that time clock in a 24-hour cycle. How many hours a day was I spending playing video games? How many hours a day was I watching TV and doing shit that was not benefiting me? And then can I shift that more towards something that's going to plant seeds for the future and really come back to help me long term? There was, you know, that ended my video game career. That literally ended that. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife and I got rid of our TV uh, a few months ago. It did totally end it. You were in a video game. That's right, man. I was, I, and it's funny because I was in Mafia Three as the main character. He was the face <laughs> of Fine, Mafia Three. Finally, 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 oh, really? oh. I didn't I, know that. I bought it just God. to play. I was like, I'm Kyle Kingsbury. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna kill this. I finally know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Every move in that game is me. I did the, all the 2K mocap for it, That's and awesome. uh, and it's funny because I don't even have a PlayStation Four to play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so I, I played the game, and my brother-in-law's. I got him the game so I could play it over there. But that's funny. Yeah, I mean, that's really what sparked the interest to want to read and learn more. And then, you know, like uh, one of my favorite quotes is Bruce Lee's: "It's not enough to to know; we must do." You know, mm-hmm. so reading and learning, and then trying and implementing, and refining and fine-tuning—that's been the name of the game. And the more I experiment on myself, like Tim Ferriss does, and like Ben Greenfield does. Mm-hmm the better the results, you know, because that teaches me what works for me and what really is impactful. Yeah. And I think that's that's a lifelong practice. You know, there's no end game there. That experimenting on yourself, though, has also kind of uh, led into your research and development and the product development for what you guys are doing here at Onnit. Um, what's, what goes into that process for you guys? And um, if you're allowed to talk about what are you guys working yeah, on? Yeah, well, I can't give you too much info on 
stuff that we haven't created yet, but we can definitely talk about the process. You know, when Aubrey brought me in here, I thought I was just going to take over the On It podcast. I, I didn't know, you know, he's, I didn't know what the other things entailed. But you know, you didn't so, know his master plan. Yeah, like, man. He, hey, why don't you just come and train a little he, bit? He like, knew me better than I knew myself, <laughs> you know. And and I've been playing with supplements since creatine six thousand es from Muscle Tech was out. You know, yes. I think I was fifteen <laughs> years old taking that. Like, whoa, I'm stronger. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah, I get to work on you know product development for supplements and for some of the food products we're designing right now is just as big of a passion of mine as the as the podcast is. And, you know, we do the social media and things like that. That's fun. But, I mean, really, it's about what stuff are we creating that has an impact on people. And it's cool because, you know, getting plugged in, we have teams for everything. You know, like it's not like I'm on my own in any one particular thing. And coming into these teams that have been working and already creating great products long before I got here, it's been awesome. You know, they go to trade shows and they come back and just dump all the samples on my desk and say, see what works. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, all right, well, we got an idea for this product. We got an idea for that product. Let's start combining shit. And my desk is the kitchen, you know, and I'm, I'm the lab. And uh, when I find something that works, I pass that on to Aubrey and a few of the other guys, John Wolf, uh, Primal Soldier, mm -hmm. you know, and if we get the thumbs up, then we pass it on to some of our athletes. We work with Exos now. Uh, they used to be API. Actually, when I was at ASU, that was their only location, was right there in Tempe, right by the football field. And they work with, you know, some of the best pro athletes in the world. I think they have 90% of the military contracts, all special forces. We had um, 12 guys that are going into the NFL draft here, but between their 400 locations, I think they have 90 going into the league this year. Wow. I mean, they are, they are performance. So we've been working on things, and we can talk about that. Like, most products we've created on it, are a combination of different ingredients to create something new. And a lot of those single ingredients are things that are already backed by science, so it's not like we're taking a huge risk by combining them with other like-minded products to create something unique. But having Exos as a partner now, and we're providing them with all their supplements, we get to have the sports performance line. So that means back to, back to the basics. You know, we've created creatine monohydrate. Yeah. Right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> right, guys? It's, are, a, it's guys, a whopper. Yeah. Are we loading it still? Are it's we loading load. it still or no? <laughs> no, no load. Good, lo good. No load. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's funny because it's like, man, we really <laughs> just. Load phase. We, I forgot about that. <laughs> That's so funny. 20 grams a 20 day. 20 grams a yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, then you could go into your base period, then reload in six more weeks. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. But, yeah, so, I mean, it's God, funny because it's like, that. that's like the most. <laughs> bottom of the barrel basic ass supplement ever yeah but they need it and you know it's it's nice for our fans to be able to get that from one place and i just like the fact that it is the most science-backed supplement ever created you know and now they're looking at it as a nootropic because anything that feeds the mitochondria and creates more atp influences the brain as well as the muscle and so that's cool to have that in-house i get it for free uh that's a sweet deal <laughs> Um, you know, making a electrolyte product that we came out with for Exos as well that uses platinose. It's a beet sugar, lower glycemic index, um, but still helping with glycogen restoration and things like that. Much higher levels of electrolytes like magnesium and things we actually need in training than you'd get in Gatorade. So that's been that's been a cool project, you know, and then really looking forward to the future. We just got to go out to uh, me and a couple other members of the product development team went out to New Jersey for Supply Side East, which is a giant convention where a lot of supplement developers will put in the research, get things patented, and then try to ship it out to larger companies like ours that have the marketing. And it's our job when we go through there to really have an idea of what we want to create and then just start to piece together all the parts to that, try it out, see if it works, and then pass that on. And I think that's been a cool process to be a part of. Oh, that's very that's cool. awesome. Where can people find you? I am at Kingsboo, K-I-N-G-S-B-U, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I will not friend you on Facebook because I never go on there and I'm maxed out. But uh, <laughs> you can you can find us at you, on You need it. a fan page now, dude. I know. I do, I do need a fan page, but I can't stand Facebook. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's if I post on Facebook, it's because I clicked the Facebook link on my Instagram. Instagram post. That's it. That's the only time I'm active there. But um, and then yeah. you see all the red dots. You're like, "Get me out! I'm out! <laughs> that, Go!" That seems to be the standard now. Yeah. yeah. I don't know very many people that use Facebook exclusively. It's all it's all Instagram push to Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So we got we got that. We got at on it for Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I do the on it uh, Facebook live every other week now on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Central Time. So that's a 30 minute Q and A. People can just jump on and, and ask me any question they have on. Anything, supplements, diet, health, and wellness, plant medicines, whatever. 
nothing nothing's off topic. So that's been a cool one. And then of course, check us out at the On It podcast. Available where all fine pad- podcasts are located, such as yourselves. Right now, Von Ra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Strong coffee. Tell us about. It. We had some this morning. Freaking delicious. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stuff strong. is killer. Time re- time release. I'll do it for you. Yeah. Stuff is killer. <laughs> I don't even know all the things. L theanine is that what we got? Yeah, we got L theanine. Uh, I can feel it right now. Yeah. That's why yeah. this podcast was so dope today. Yeah, yeah, L theanine. Yeah. Sophisticated energy. Right. You know. So it's uh, it's L theanine, uh, coconut water extract, hyaluronic acid, MCT oil, and collagen, all in cold brew. Uh, instant coffee, so it's a 100% instant solution to most people's energy and nutritional needs. Great way to cool. break your fast and kind of get things going in the in the in the AM. You can find me at at Strong Coffee Company or at Von Rothfelder. Dig it. Oh, yeah, Doug Larson, and it's delicious. You gotta, it you is get, delicious. You have yeah, to yeah, tell yeah. People it's delicious. You know it is delicious, and I'm you know to be honest with you, if I could if I could just yeah. take a half a second longer, I'm always amazed when I give it to guys like you, who you know strike me as somebody who's going to be like. Oh, I'm a black coffee guy, or I'm a this, or I'm a that, and then you have it. And I mean, it's it, it is delicious, and it's 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 like it's sweet. You know, I, I jokingly say it's like coffee and donut had a baby. You know, and it's like it's it's that good, right? Dessert fucking. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. T-shirt so, coming your t-shirt, way soon. T-shirt coming soon. So I mean, it, it's been amazing, and just kind of seeing the seeing the response from it. it's been really incredible, and uh, and I'm excited for uh, our f- other flavors that are coming out. We're coming out with an unsweetened, and uh, then we're gonna come out with a caffeine free because Doug was telling me how much his Half wife. Half calf. Yeah, his well, his wife loves it so much, and she, he's like, I would drink this, but I don't want the caffeine and all the other. Things inside of it are so beneficial that the caffeine is just kind of like an added yeah. bonus to those that need it. Dude, the decaf can be what I drink before I go to bed as a little yeah, yeah, yeah. desserts fucking. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. with L-theanine <laughs> yeah, yeah. in there. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you got to yeah. have it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> what do you got, Doug? Uh, obviously, you can find me on everything Barbell Shrug and Barbell Collective. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Douglas E. Larson. Right on. Get into the Shrug Collective on all the socials. Uh, get into iTunes, YouTube, like, subscribe, share everything. Leave us a five-star review. We'll see you guys next week. Welcome to the Shrugged Collective Program Vault. Over the last six years, we've been leading the charge in online strength and conditioning programming and coaching. And for the first time in the history of the Shrugged Collective, we're combining our 11 best-selling long-term and short-term accessory programs into one membership site called the Program Vault. From Olympic weightlifting to strongman, leaning out, nutrition, you name it, Our 11 best-selling programs are yours for $47 a month. Get to shruggedcollective.com backslash vault and you will find immediate access to our 11 best-selling strength conditioning programs. Next on Barbell Shrug, Adi Kaju talking about how the top 20 athletes in CrossFit are eating these days. Damn.